church, I don't know about you, but I believe God is turning some things around today. We believe it, come on. See, I've searched the world, yep. but it couldn't fill me. Sing it out, come on. See, magic evades, and treasures of faith, and ever and I love this right here. Then you came along. You put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied.
one more time, we gotta let those voices rise in this house. Say there's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing. Sing it out, church. There's nothing. That's right. Now, if you know that there was no one better than our God, would you just begin to worship him in this place? God, we believe there is no one better than you. There is no one greater than you, God. You've carried us time and time again. And we respond to your faithfulness with praise and with worship this morning. Come on, we sing this again. The times I've been weak, you have been strong. Found there's nothing like strength of Lord. You help me let go when I try to hold on to everything in my life that didn't belong. Come on, we sing it. What is heavy? Every voice. What is heavy? Sing. What is heavy? You can lift it. times of trouble we can say in times of trouble you defend me in every battle I know you will fight strength is perfect look it up your strength
you to roll with me a few minutes. I just got to obey God. I can't get away from it. I de- and I don't have all of it. I feel like the Lord's just giving me a little bit of it. But the Lord told me there's a group of people in here today that you have recently been just rocked by bad news. I don't know if it's bad news about someone else. I don't know if it's bad news about someone you love. I don't know if it's bad news about a family. I don't know if it's bad news about a job. I don't, I don't know if it's bad news about a diagnosis you just got. I don't know what it is. But, but I mean, when I tell you, you you've, you're caught in it. Um, it's like it's like this news rocked you so bad that it's just sucked you down in a hole that you can't crawl out of you you feel like your faith is gone you feel like your hope is gone and you're here this morning and you're not singing songs in joy you're singing them out of desperation and I just have to wait a minute and give you a minute it, it may be three or four it may be 30 or 40 And I'm just going to not worry about time right now. My goal is to make sure God ministers to his people. My goal is not to keep an agenda. And I'll have to answer to whether or not I obey him. And I'm going to tell you, I feel this so strong. I feel like I, I feel like I have a heaviness in my chest. If that's you, I right now, I just want you to forget about what anybody thinks. I just need you to come stand here in front of me because I heard what the Lord said. We're going to pray and we're going to break this thing in Jesus name. Just come stand. I don't care if it's a handful of you or if it's a half a church. I don't care. Just right down here in front of me, right down here, closest to me, right down here at the stage. You've just gotten news and it has been devastating to you. It's been devastating to you. I'll tell you what she said in just a minute. Miss Lisa, I probably, Pastor Lisa, I need you to get some people ready to just lay hands and minister. Come on down here. Yeah, sometimes people act like they can't scared to get close to me. I'm not going to spit on you. I don't have COVID. Don't worry about it. Just come on up here close to me. Come on up here close to me. I didn't prepare Pastor Lisa with this. I've thrown it on her. So if those of you that serve along with her, if you would, just come on up here. I want everybody to have hands laid on them. I want everyone to have hands laid on them. know what y'all are good at what you do pick something out pick something out (laughs) might need one of our servers to serve with some tissues some some people right in here in the middle that are really broken some of you this news has made you fearful some of this news has broken your heart some of you this news has depressed you I don't know the nature of the news I just knew I couldn't move forward I did I felt like a block was sitting on my chest if I didn't do this I can't tell you how God's gonna turn it around I just will tell you God will turn it around he turns graves into gardens he turns mourning into dancing he turns seas into highways And I brought you down here to tell you he's the only one who can. Come on, somebody. I know you're crying now, but I'm going to pump some joy in you because you may have lost the battle, but you have not lost the war. Come on. And God will not let you fight alone, for the battle is not yours. The battle is God's to fight. And where your fighting leaves off, God's fighting takes up. (laughs) And I just give away some faith, and I give away some encouragement today. And before we move on with this service, I had to take some time and let God minister to you. Would you help the praise team and just set an atmosphere, church, everybody in the building, if you would just be worshipful? All of our altar workers begin praying, begin laying hands on them. Just move through them and lay hands on them. You change everything, chains for fear, bow fear.
Those of you at the altar, those of you at the altar, I know some of you are just overcome with emotion right now, but if you can listen to me. It is the job of your enemy to create around you that contradicts what's in you. That's his job. Jesus told Peter, come. And he started walking on the water. But then the enemy creates the wind and the waves. The word told him he could walk. The winds and waves told him to sink. You are at a point where God is saying, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the word or are you going to believe the winds and the waves? Because I'm here to tell you, God, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. It will never fail you. And if God said he'll do it, he will do it. And your God cannot lie. I'm about to run all over this building. I feel the Bible in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus, you change everything. You change everything. Let's pray and let's break this thing. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not belittling the fact that it hurts. I know what it is to get bad news. I'm not over, I'm not, I'm not that I know that it makes you cry. I know it pains your heart. But there's a moment where we cry with you. Then there's another moment where we reach down and pull you out of it. Let's pray. And after this, I want y'all to sing something celebratory and we're going to dance all the way back to our seat because God has broken it. Lift your hands with me in this building. Lord, we thank you that the anointing destroys even the yoke of bad news. And whether it's relational, whether it's health, whether it's disease related, whether it's about a loved one, whether it's about an economy, about a job, it does not matter. We thank you, God, that you are turning this situation in our favor right now. This thing is turning right now in our favor. And what the enemy meant for evil, God will bring about for good. And I thank you that I will look back on this moment and I will thank you because I thought it was the end, but I saw it was only the beginning. And I thank you that this moment is promoting me to a new season to operate on a new level. And I will be faithful, God, in the bad so that you can promote me in the good. So we declare this broken in Jesus' name and the whole building shouted amen. Amen and amen. Turn around and dance all the way back to your seat. Come on, let's dance back to your seat. decided to follow Jesus, you made the greatest decision of your life that will bless and impact you for eternity. Let us know about your decision by texting the number at the bottom of your screen. Also, if this is your first time here, welcome! Introduce yourself to us by texting the number at the bottom of your screen. If you're ready to find out what we're all about and discover your purpose, Growth Track is for you. Get plugged into the ministry by going to www.i.church and clicking on Grow. Now let's head back into service. When I take these two or three minutes at offering time, let me ask a question. Is it, is it helpful when I come up here and try to explain a little bit? I, let me tell you why I do that. I was raised in church and they were real good at just telling you to do stuff. They did, they just tell you to do things. They didn't tell you, they didn't tell you why you were doing it. They said, raise your hands. Okay, what is it doing? Y'all need to shout amen. 
Amen. What is that doing? They tell you to give. Why? And what I try to do is help you understand you can't fully possess a thing that you don't understand. You, fully can't, you can't fully possess the power of it till you understand it. There are two parts to the gospel. The gospel of Jesus, the man, and the gospel of Jesus, his teaching. Jesus, the man, prepares you for heaven. Jesus, his teaching, prepares you for earth. Okay? Jesus, the man, gives you peace. Jesus, the teaching, gives you prosperity. So I have the man brings me peace and then when I understand how he thinks and how his kingdom works, it causes my life to rise. It's impossible to obey God and your life not elevate. It's impossible. So whatever area of your life is just drowning, when you learn what God says in those areas, your life begins to rise. Seed is a picture of your future. God has given you power to create outcomes with your words, with your decisions and with your giving. Those are the three seed things called seed in the Bible. I can create the outcomes I desire. He said the whole kingdom is sowing and reaping. The Bible says you reap what you sow. A lot of people used to say that in a negative sense. Ron Jr., you're gonna reap what you sow. That's what Ron, I was Ron Jr. when they were mad at me. Ron Jr., you're gonna reap what you sow. I'll be honest with you. There's some things I can't wait to reap what I've sown. because I know what I've tried to sow. But if you were to go to Lowe's or Home Depot or a hardware store and you say, I want to plant some roses, or you say, I want to plant some tomato vines or whatever it is, you look and they have these little packets. And on that little packet is a picture. So they got beautiful rose bushes on that picture. But there's, you open that pack and that's not a rose bush. It's a seed. But they give you a picture of what the seed will do. And if you know how to use the seed, you'll get the picture. If you know how to use your seed, you'll get the picture. Father, bless the gift and the giver in this place today. Let us be generous people and let us give cheerfully. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen, amen, and amen. Here's the ways you can give. Come on, praise team. Let's go. All right, church. With faith and expectation. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our services here at Redemption. Amazing God. Amazing people. And not only people just in the building, but all of our people who gather virtually. And you are one of those, and we're so grateful for you. Thank you so much. I just want to appeal to you with the same thing that I did the people who were standing in the room with me. Because what we do in here, we try to do with you in whatever room that you're in. And that is the fact a seed is a conversation with your future. A seed is a picture of what you believe in God for. The outcome you desire in your life. And you know what? If I want an outcome, I've got to sow for it. I've got to believe for it. I've got to speak it. I've got to make decisions for it. But yes, it's not all about your giving, but it does include your giving. So we bring him the tithe, the 10%, but yet at the same time, we know that there's seed and we can name it and send it off into our future to create the harvest we desire. You don't like today's harvest? God will give you grace for it. But you have the power to change the next one today by the seed that you sow. I love you. Ask God what he would have you to do. And don't go anywhere. We're still in the Wisdom Society. Two or three weeks left and we'll finish it out. I'll see you in a minute. More people have chosen to use text to give as their preferred way of giving because it is safe, quick, and very easy. Here's how it works. Open a new text message on your phone and use your text to give number. Text RCM 2864-920-1282. The very first time you use the service to give, you will receive a text message with a link to a registration form. Click the link in the text and it will direct you to enter your information. You will only have to enter your information once to set up the service. Then it's a matter of seconds to give. It's safe and secure, easy to use, and you will receive an instant receipt. 
Add your text to give number in your contact list so you'll have it ready. That's it. Giving has never been so easy. And we thank you for your generosity. Hello, iChurch, my iChurch family, and all of our online community, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, wherever you're joining us from, your family. You're our church community, and we love you. I put this word together with redemption folk in mind. And it's called the Wisdom Society, and now we're several weeks into it. I've been getting a lot of feedback from you that it's touched you in a special way, and we're just going to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Look, guys, open your hearts and open your minds. Because when we do that and we allow the Word of God to come in and change us, we move the needle forward into who we can be and what we can do. Oh, if you've got somebody around you in the room, look at them and say, you need to get ready for this Word. Are you ready? Here we go. The brain, the brain a pulpy mass of cells and fibers, is the center of the network of fibers that make up man's nervous system. Extending upward into the skull, the spinal cord widens to form the brain stem. And in man, in the conscious state, much behavior is based on learning. I'm two months in to this Wisdom Society teaching, and I'm going to be honest with you. I just, you know, for sake of people's attention span, I'm just going to have to take it and move on to something else. Maybe come back in the fall and revisit it because I'm nowhere even close. Um, and that's what happens once I start studying and digging. I just see so much. I had the prob I probably only got to preach about 30% of stuff I had planned for today in the first service. <clears throat> I just... When I'm preparing it, I don't know how long it'll take to say it. So it studies quick, and then I get up here and start preaching it, and it don't last that long because I get to run in my mouth. Come on, somebody. And, uh, but anyway, the desire is to, conf to confront the practicalities of things that can sabotage our life. This is not highly deep. This is not where I'm taking the Scripture and just exegete and breaking down in Greek and Hebrew. I'm not doing that. It's just simple things from the book of Proverbs, which is the wisdom of God. You are getting to peer into God's mind. The book of Proverbs is how God thinks. Most people stay on a low level with God. They just try not to sin, just trying to do the right thing. But we got to move past that one day and get where it's easier to do right than it is to do wrong. And then you move to the next level. Not is it right or wrong, but is it wise? Because there's a lot of things that are morally neutral. But are they good or are they bad for you? Um, I've had many good things cross my path that I had to say no to. Because although it was a good thing, it was not Ron's thing. And so the Bible says all things are lawful for you. God's not chasing you down with the Ten Commandments trying to hammer you. The Bible says all things are lawful for you, but not everything is beneficial and so that's where I'm trying to take us in these eight to 10 weeks uh, to be people of wisdom. The Bible says that if any man lacks wisdom, first of all, just let him ask. Uh, you know, I'll go all the way back foundational. You know, have you asked God not to be smart, but to be wise? Wise people know how to apply what they know. I know people who are Bible scholars and cannot string two sentences together to teach somebody. I mean scholars, okay? I'm not, I'm not a Bible scholar. I know people who know a lot but cannot execute it, okay? Wisdom is also the ability to know difference, okay? If you're married, it would do you well to know the difference between your wife and all other women. Be very wise, actually. Very wise. <clears throat> the difference in a room, the difference in a moment, the difference in an opportunity, the difference in someone's countenance, the difference when the door needs to close, the difference when the door needs to open, the difference for whose presence you're in. The, those, those are wisdom keys. And so these are the things I'm trying to speak about, not to bore you. I told my wife, I said, I'm having such a hard time because I'm used to my preaching being a, a dialogue, going back and forth with you. 
But on the wisdom stuff, it's been like a monologue. I said, I'm not used to that. When y'all just let me talk, y'all make me nervous. So uh, if you find a little place to amen, amen me here every once in a while, all right? I'm staying with this ant and spider. And l listen, there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, and the whole last chapter deals with women. And since Solomon had 800 wives and what, 500 concubines, he probably needed to talk a little bit about women because um, he didn't do a very good job with them. Uh, but there's 30 chapters in this, and I've only got to that much. But I got to stay with it because in these four animals are really the theme of the whole book. Proverbs 30, let's read together. There are four things <coughs> which are little upon the earth, but are exceedingly wise. Small, but wise. Look at their function. The ants are not a people, are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. The rock badger, which is kind of like a more feeble, like a, of a rabbit, are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crag. So the ants uh, in Proverbs 6 says they have no king, they have no ruler, they have no leader yet they go about their business. In other words, wise people are internally motivated and internally inspired. You can't be waiting on someone to tell you how good a job you're doing every day to keep going. Life is not indebted to do that to you, okay? In fact, a lot of you will have to be internally inspired despite people criticizing you. So that's, that's what the ant brings to the table. Then he says, the rock badger or the rabbit, it doesn't have sharp teeth, it doesn't have claws, it doesn't have a tough coat, it's not fast, so what does it do? It hides in the cracks of the rocks. It makes itself safe. It understands its weaknesses and it compensates. I talked about that three weeks ago. The locusts have no king, yet they advance in ranks. Here the theme is equal cooperation. They cooperate, they work together, and they take what's ever in front of them, if you've ever seen a swarm of locusts. And last of all, the spider skillfully grasps with its hands, and it's in king's palaces. There's no room these guys can't get in. So Father, bless your word in Jesus' name, and give me supernatural communication power. And everybody said amen and amen. Can I have about 30 minutes? I can't do this in 20. I can't do it in 30, actually but I'll take about 30. Somebody said 45. Do I hear, do I hear a, a minute, an hour? I, mean, <laughs> I know how you feel now, but y'all be looking at your watch in about 35 minutes. So, and <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about plans and priorities. Plans and priorities. I've talked about the ant in probably seven or eight different points. Today, the fact that it gathers in the summer to prepare for winter. It always has a plan. It always has a plan. If my wife don't mind me sharing this, we were having one of our, me and my wife are very touchy-feely and lovey-dovey. I know some of y'all, that makes you want to go, uh, but that's just how we are. And there's one of the times we on this trip, and I said, I said, what do you love most about me? And I, you know, I had my, in my mind, I thought the top two or three things she would say. And she said, she got quiet, she said, I love that you always have a plan. I wasn't expecting that one. But after she said it, I poked out my chest a little bit. I liked it when she said, I like that you always have a plan. The ant never reacts, it acts. Too many of us live life responding to it instead of creating it. You just show up tomorrow instead of creating a tomorrow. Some people show up at retirement. Other people create a retirement. Here we go. And you've got to understand your God is a God of priority and plan. The Bible is a book of priorities. The whole book is a book of priorities. Learning what deserves your attention and learning what does not. And when you get that, then you know what to say yes to and you know what to say no to. So many things in getting the priorities of your life correct. I, I, I tell y'all every once in a while about our upbringing. I, I don't want to tell you too much. So I'm scared you won't want to listen to me anymore. But you know, my, my mom's side, which is the side I worked on, they, they, were, they were simple people, farming people, worked in the field. They were actually highly successful. 
people, but they were the kind that didn't trust anything. So they'd, the money they'd make, they buried under the house. That type of stuff. They didn't, they didn't trust banks or anything like that. I'm serious, y'all. This stuff y'all see in movies, I was raised that way. And then you get to my daddy's side. I don't even know how my dad was sane. They were just a bunch of blumbering drunks. Uh, my dad's dad, my granddad, who I never got to meet, uh, died when he was 48 because he got drunk, went out in a snowstorm naked and caught pneumonia. He died, 48 years old. His sister, last time I saw my dad's sister, she couldn't even speak. She was so drunk. Just a whole generation. Of the, the, his, his daddy, his granddaddy. I mean, everybody down the line. The family business, if you want to call it that, was like a pool hall. I don't know what they call it here. Billiards, whatever. Like, it's just a pool hall. And so my dad saw people get pistol whipped and beat with cue sticks. And that was just everyday living. But man, my dad could shoot pool. Good gracious. My dad was a preacher, but I mean, he could out hustle anybody on a pool table. And uh, cause he was raised in it, that's what they did. And uh, on the same property with that little pool hall was this little room, Hope got to see it. My great grandfather had the worst health habits I've ever seen and he lived to be almost a hundred. Terrible, he smoked a cigar as big as my thigh every day of his life that I ever saw him. He smoked them all day from breakfast till he went to bed. I never saw him when he didn't have smoke coming out of his mouth. And he lived to be almost a hundred, how I do not know. And he was a liar, good gracious he could lie. He was a scoundrel, he was well known as being a hustler in the city. If you'd say his name and people start laughing, but he was my great granddad. He lived till I was in my mid twenties. Uh, Hope got to meet him. And he would just sit me down as a little boy and he'd tell me all these lies about World War I. Not World War II, he was in World War I. <laughs> and he'd sit me down, he called me Sonny. He'd say, Sonny, he said, in one day, I had the entire German army on the run. <laughs> and he puffed that cigar and he said, and they never did catch me. <laughs> Just tell me all kind of stuff. But they had this little house. Hope, how big was this house? I'm not kidding. Five, 600 square feet. <laughs> they had this house, if you want to even call it a house. And, and you would... In this house, none of the windows were the same size. None of the doors matched. All the doorknobs were different. You get to one room in the house and the room just start going down. You ever been in them theme park things in the house of mirrors and you gotta keep your balance and hold on to the wall? There was one room you had to hold on to the wall because it's just going down. Because what they would do is he would build a house and he would get his drunk buddies and buy them beer and say, I'll buy you a case of beer, help me put in windows today. And they would go to Lowe's and whatever windows was on sale, that's the ones that went in the house. There was no architect, there was no plans, there was no meeting codes, there was no nothing. And this was the most cockeyed jack leg house you have ever seen in your life. And that's what my dad was raised in. That's what he lived in. And what it was, was a picture of no plan. And you say, why are you telling me about your family lineage? I didn't take a bath and drive over here to hear about your family problems. I told you all that to let you know, because the way that house was built is the way I see too many people living life. No plan, no strategy in place. And let me tell you what I've learned. If you don't plan life, life will plan it for you. And you'll spend your whole life responding to the tyranny of your next problem instead of creating outcomes that you desire. Now, does everything happen just like you want it to? No, nothing in my life has happened exactly like what I want to do, but I'm like I want it to. But I'm pretty close to where I wanted to shoot at by this time in my life. Why? Because even though things from the outside would try to alter the plan, the thing is God always brings you back to the plan because he works all things out for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. So I've learned that God can take things in the plan and take when I screwed up the plan and when other people tried to mess up my plan, if God has ordained the thing, it doesn't matter. He can take it and work it all out. Good, bad, ugly, don't matter what it is, he can keep the plan and get you where you're supposed to go. Would you shout amen to that? <laughs> Your God is a God of plan and a God of strategy. He told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 3, he said, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. There's two kind of no. There's no by knowledge and there's the no by experience. And he used the one by experience. 
Now, I don't theologically know that I understand all that, but he's saying, before you got into the earth, I already had experienced you, Jeremiah. I was intimately acquainted with you, and I ordained that you be a prophet to the nations. So there was something waiting on you when you showed up. That's why God created Adam last. He didn't create Adam on the first day and say, oh, I got to find something for him to do. He created a garden first, and then he created man and placed man in the garden. So he placed man in the place he had prepared for him. Let me tell you something. You didn't show up in this life, and God scratched his head and said, man, I got to find something for them to do. God had already prepared a garden. God had already ordered your steps. God was already intimately acquainted with you, and when you showed up, everything that you needed to get to your destiny was here waiting on you when you got here come on somebody shout hallelujah God created the sun before he created the grass because he knew the grass would need the sun he created the grass before he created the cow because he knew the cow would need the grass that needed the sun God has an order to things God has a plan to things and God has a strategy and there's one for your life you may not have found it yet but once you understand the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way your life will change forever excuse me Hallelujah! Somebody give him five minutes of praise that God has a plan for you. Ah! Can I go deeper? Hallelujah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me in paths of... Your life has a path. There's a pathway. It's not random. It's not a random order of events that hopefully somehow you hit purpose before you die. But here's the thing. Jesus hung on the cross and said it is finished. That means in heaven, in the heavens... In the unseen, everything is finished and scripted. But in the earth, it is yet to be played out. So there is a plan scripted in heaven for your life. They coordinate with the gifts and ability. I don't have time to teach you all this. That God has given you. They correlate to it. But whether or not that plan is lived out will not be up to God. It will be up to you. It will be up to you. Okay. The book Bible is a book of priorities. Just roll with me. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Why do we keep seeking things? Seek the kingdom. All the stuff is in the kingdom. The more I learn about the kingdom, the less I pray about stuff. <clears throat> Me and my wife lack no thing, but we seek the kingdom every day. And God says, seek my kingdom, my keys, my principles, my ways of doing and being right, my ways of bringing heaven into the earth. Seek that. And he said, all this other stuff. Don't chase the stuff. He said, do that first, priority. He said, I tell you what, if you bring a gift to God and you get down and realize that your brother has alt with you, first, get up and go be reconciled to your brother. A year ago, I, uh, years ago, I did a whole series on first things. I went through the whole Bible and talked about everything God said do first. He said, first be reconciled. He said, and then when you've done that, then come back and offer your gift. God said, I don't care how generous you are if everybody's mad at you and you're mad at everybody. First, be priority. This is more important than this. He said, you know what? Those of you that are always judging and looking at the speck in your brother's eye, he said, won't you take this beam out your own eye? He said, first, take the beam out of your own eye. Then you might be a little more qualified to help the brother out with the speck that's in his eye. 
See, the priority is what? Focus on you first and then God will work everything out with the other person. In other words, he says, take care of you because you are a full-time job. Am I doing all right? Priorities. God walked up into Mary and Martha's house who was the, uh, they were the sisters of Lazarus. He loved them. He went to their house. Martha is serving. Mary sits down and worships. He told Martha, he said, there's two things happening here, service and worship. And Mary has chosen the greater. Hallelujah. <laughs> she gets it, amen. Mary has chosen the greater. Why? Because service is important, but it flows out of worship. If you don't have your worship life, you're not gonna serve very long and you're not gonna serve very well because the worship is where you get the strength to do the service. In our database, we try to have enough people here serving and volunteering that everybody gets to come into the service because if somebody misses every Sunday, they're gonna be serving, but they're not gonna get their worship. Come on, somebody. And service comes out of worship. There are two things happening right here, Mary and, and Martha, and Mary has chosen the greater one. The priority is on the worship. The priority is on taking care of yourself. The priority is on getting rid of the alt with your brother. The priority is on seeking first the kingdom. The Bible is a book of priorities. And I've learned this in life. If you don't get first right, second, third, and fourth don't have a chance. But if you can get the first thing right, most of the time the other things have a tendency to fall in line. Can I go deeper? Yes. Please just let me hear you say amen one time if you're okay. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> I am, I'm gonna preach it. <laughs> Let me go off script a little bit. You have to determine what is going to have your attention. Because whatever has your attention becomes your master. There's some of you, you have a very bright future in front of you, but your past has your attention. And it's your master. Some of you, God has so many wonderful relationships to bring in your life, but your divorce has your attention. And you can't forget those things which are behind and press on toward the mark of the high calling in God. You know why? Because whatever has your attention becomes your master. Some of you, Instagram has your attention. And what has your attention becomes your master. Please don't let Twitter be your master. <clears throat> okay? If all you're about is money, nothing wrong with prosperity. I preach it here. But if that's the only thing that has your attention, it has become your master. <laughs> I'm, I'm off script now. I'm just trying to help... I, by nature, am a fighter. <laughs> I don't mean UFC boxer fight. I mean, I'm just, I'm just a fighter. And I don't ask people to help me. When I'm in a fight, I don't call all my friends. I just get in a foxhole and I bear down and I start swinging. And I'm a fighter, okay? And then I started getting tired. Because may I tell you something about your enemy called the devil? He'll have you fighting everything, every day, the rest of your life. So I even had to choose what will I fight. I, at 54 years old, there's just some hills I'm not willing to down. Me and Hope are watching a documentary the other night. We watch movies every once in a while, but we, we both like to learn. We both like to watch documentaries. So we finally get to our time at night. We're throwing some sweat, sit on the couch, and we'll pick one out. So we're watching a documentary, and I'm on it. <laughs> Guys eating my lunch. I'm sitting there going, with popcorn. Watching myself getting eaten alive. I went there for entertainment. 
Do you know what the South Carolina four-wheel drive truck in me wanted to do? <laughs> See, in South Carolina, you don't call a lawyer. You turn your hat around. <laughs> I came out here, we call lawyers. South Carolina, just get in your truck and handle it yourself. <laughs> oh, man. I had about 10 things. Everything he said was a lie. I'm thinking defamation. I'm defamation of character. I'm thinking all, the, all these things that he's responsible. I mean, he published on a documentary. And then I sit there and think, why am I going to put him on my platform? You see what I'm talking about? And what are the spoils? Ron Carpenter no longer fights where there are no longer spoils. If there's nothing to win, why are you fighting? What are you fighting for? There's two things I fight now in my life at this, at this season. I fight for anything that threatens my destiny in God. And I fight, I, I fight things that have spoils. In other words, there's something to win. Some of you that argue with your spouse all the time, can I tell you something? The point of an argument is not to win, it's a solution. Yeah. There is such a thing as healthy conflict and contention, but it's for, the, it's for the purpose of solution, not the purpose of saying, I beat you, I outtalked you, I cut you deeper. <laughs> That's not the purpose of it. I can't get no help in this building. I must be all, a, I'm all up in your closet today. I done left you then. I done moved and start cleaning out your closet. What, what will you give your attention to? Because what's in front of you tends to get in you. 2 Corinthians 3. I do have this one on script. <laughs> now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Next verse. But we all, with unveiled face, talking about people that are saved, born again, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. What same image? The same image as what you behold. Yeah. What you're constantly looking at, you become. So I have to prioritize what's gonna get my attention and what am I gonna put in front of me? Because your mind is a minimizer and your mind is a maximizer. Your mind can make it as big as you want to and your mind can make it as small as you want to. And it's all up to your mind the way you think. I am preaching. <laughs> I can take a problem and I can blow it up as big as this building in my mind. Or I can take God and blow him up as big as the world in my mind. It all has to do with what gets my attention and what gets my focus. Because can I tell you something? The enemy don't have to defeat you. All he's got to do is break your focus. People fail because of broken focus. You cannot move in the same direction while being distracted at the same time. And some of you who he knows he can't beat, he just distracts. Can I go just a little bit? I know what time it is, but yeah, I promise you, in and out is not going to close before you leave here. I promise you. <clears throat> this, this ain't in my notes, but this minimize and maximize thing. Attention is a very powerful thing. There's such a thing I learned in psychology as attention, then there's focused attention. In other words, in this room, there's probably 1,500 people that are vying for my attention. There's probably 150, 200 lights that are trying to get my attention. There's a beast board, what we call that, and two screens trying to get my attention. But Ron gets to choose where he will focus it. There's all kind of things wanting but I get to choose where I focus it, okay? That's what I'm talking about now is your focus. Your mind can make it big, your mind can make it small. The Bible says that this is what the kingdom is like. This is what people are like. The kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field. And for the joy thereof, the man went and sold all he had. Listen now, listen. Not to buy the treasure, he bought the whole field. The treasure is what we're after, but it's always in a field. And you get to choose what you magnify. Every person in this room has got a treasure. 
every person in this room. They have something divine on the inside of them. But what is a field? It's dirt. Do you know what God says the kingdom is? The kingdom is like great things hidden in dirty things. He said, but you can't just buy the great. You got to buy the whole thing. Those of you that are getting married, you got to buy the whole field. Well, we're not going to bring our families into our relationship. We've just decided that we're, we're just not. <laughs> well, we're not going to bring our past and, and, and you know, our other relationship. Blah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> You're getting the whole field. You're getting them and everything that's ever happened to them. You're getting them and you're getting their whole story. But an excavator, stay with me, I'm going to stop on this point. An excavator who is a treasure hunter, hunting for precious gems, gold, precious metals. He understands that to find an ounce of gold, you have to move a ton of dirt. He understands that's the nature of it. To find the treasure, it's in dirt. You got to move dirt constantly to find a little bit of treasure. Okay? But he never goes into the process looking for the dirt. And so many times we wake up and look at our husband. And we magnify the dirt and we minimize the treasure. I don't know what they said, but I hope they're not in trouble when they get home. <coughs> My wife don't get up every day and start telling me everything I'm doing wrong. She told me last night she don't like the way I hold my fork. I can handle a couple a day. <coughs> you magnify the treasure to the place where you don't even hardly see the dirt no more. And we're supposed to be treasure hunters. The church ain't supposed to be dirt hunters. The kingdom of God knows that people that are walking in that door got problems. But there's something divine and precious and amazing in every one of them. And I'm not gonna sit here and debate about your dirt because we all got it and I don't want you to debate mine. but I wanna help you remove the dirt because I believe there's something amazing down in there. I'm trying to stop. I'm trying to find a place to stop. When you get your priorities set, okay, I said I was gonna stop on the last one. I'm gonna stop on this one. When you get your priorities set, it helps you define whether or not you're making progress because there's a difference between progress and movement. If I say, I want y'all all to meet me in San Francisco down at the wharf and we're going to get some chowder after service. Let's all go down there. Y'all meet me. And I go out of here and get on 101 South. And I'm driving 70 miles an hour on 101 South as hard as I can go. And I'm like, man, I just, where's San Francisco? I'm making movement at 70 miles an hour, but I've made no progress. Until you understand the priorities of your life. Let me tell you something, I love you. I love redemption. I love redemption virtue. I love redemption east. I love redemption. Back. I've given my whole life to this thing called redemption. Outside of my family, it's the only thing that even proves I existed. You are that. But my priority is my family. Amen. And if I ever get in a thing where I am having to choose between you or my family, you're going to lose. That's right. That's right. Because I got my priorities. Do, do you know what I'm saying? You know you're making progress because the closer you get to the destination, the more signs you see. 
So you get on it now to say, what, 362 miles to L.A. or something like that. But then you'll start saying 82 miles, 74 miles. Start saying signs says 66 miles, 51 miles. The closer you get, the more signs that pop up in front of you. I want us to be wise people. I'm only going to take about two more weeks with this. But is this helping you? I got to know this is helping you. Would you do me a favor? Stand up on your feet and look at about four people and say, this will change your life. Come on, say, this will change. Woo! I love you. I want the best for you. I'm believing the best. And I hope you're enjoying these messages. I really do. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. What a great crowd. May the Lord establish you and may bring you peace. May this be the very best week of your whole life. In Jesus' name, amen. Yo, guys, go have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week. Did that message impact your life? You can listen to it all over again for free. Go to roncarpenter.com forward slash message for the free download. We have had Red Worship's EP, The Loudest Color, on repeat. Stream now on all your favorite platforms and share with all your family and friends. Redemption, Easter is only one month away and we can't wait. We truly believe that souls will be saved and Easter will be an experience you'll never forget. Start inviting your friends and family to join right here online at i.church on Easter weekend. Anytime anyone in the Bible had an encounter with God, their whole walk of life shifted. God can do the same thing for you at this year's 212 conference. Join us from April 20th to the 21st as Robert Madu and Christine Kane come to the Bay Area at our West Coast campus. We can't wait to see you there. God loves to take all broken things and to reshape them and conform them into His image. It's that pushing every single day to become better so that we can look like Jesus and bear His image. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you desiring to be every single thing that God has called you to be. Come on, there's nothing wrong with you wanting to have the best business. There's nothing wrong with you wanting to be the best singer. There's nothing wrong with you wanting to be the best preacher, the best leader. How many are thankful that God wants you to be great? He said, I just gotta check your motive for greatness. Apparently they have not seen what is happening at Redemption Church. Apparently they're unaware that God is alive and well in the Bay Area. And the same Jesus that has brought us here is the same Jesus that is going to take us there. It always was Jesus. So you're sitting there crying and magnifying the enemy that's coming against you. And God said, I didn't want you to cry over it. I wanted you to step on it. And I wanted you to go to the next level. It's not my worst day. It's my greatest opportunity. It's not an enemy victory. It's a footstool to the next level. If today's message has touched your heart, please consider supporting the ministry by giving. You can visit roncarpenter.com to give and learn more about us. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week here on I.Church Live.